Hey everyone, my name is Phil Blancardi. I'm the online campus pastor here at Church on Main. We are so grateful that you've joined us for the message today. If you'd like more information about our church or to connect with us or to partner with us through giving or to ask for prayer, please visit the link below. Before we begin, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to gather online this morning. We pray that you would remove all distractions as we listen into what pastor has to say. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, let us walk out of here uh, understanding what it is you have for us and how you've challenged us to go forward today, that we would apply those things and we would continue to honor you in the things that we do. In your name we pray, amen. Um, if you've got your Bibles, by the way, hey, welcome to Church on Me. If you're a guest, thank you so much for being here. My name is Brian, I'm the pastor, and uh, I'm, super, I'm super glad that you're here. It's so good uh, to see you face to face. I'd love a chance to meet you afterwards, so if you get a chance after service, I like to meet guests and say hello and just get to know a little bit about you. So if you've got your Bibles, Go ahead and turn to Mark chapter eight. That's where we're gonna be today. I'm gonna pick up in verse 11. And I always like to say, ma'am, you know, if God is good, then <laughs> if he blesses and if he makes that clock stand still, I'll get as far as I'd like to get. But I never do send, I don't often, don't always get as far as I'd like to get. So we're gonna start in verse 11. We're gonna see how far we can get today. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna read the first few verses. Um, I think I'll get through verse 21. I'm just kind of thinking out loud with y'all here. So uh, verse 11, let me read this. It says, and the Pharisees came out, began to argue with him, demanding from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation demand a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. I'm gonna stop there, we'll pray and continue in the message, let's pray. Father, we love you and God, we are so grateful. We're so grateful for all the ways in which you provide for us. God, we're grateful for all the ways in which you take care of us, you protect us. Father, we're grateful that you have extended our lives to this moment, God, we we have the honor of gathering together with fellow believers and those who are curious. God, we get to gather in this building around your word. God, it is so good that we don't have to wonder what you want of us. We don't have to wonder or guess who you are and what you would have for us. Father, we can hold a copy of your word in our hands and read it. And so, Father, we thank you for, for gathering us in this room in this moment because, Father, that means there's something that you want us to see and understand from this passage. And so, God, we ask that as we have already sung and we've prayed, God, we've worshiped, our hearts are ready. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take your word that we're about to hear and help us understand it, Lord. Not just so that we know it like a history lesson, but God, so that we understand what you would have of us. So Father, please use this passage today to conform us more into the image of your Son and draw us closer to you with this passage. Father, confront any false belief, convict us of any sin. And Lord, let us sense your presence. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can be seated. Okay, so a lot has happened where if you're new to us uh, and maybe this is your first time, let me just catch you up. So uh, Jesus has been with his, uh, the 12, his disciples. Uh, we'll later begin calling them his apostles and he's been teaching them and teaching them and teaching them and up to this point, so many times already, the disciples continue to mess up what it is that Jesus is trying to get them to see, or they continue to mess up uh, reasons for his miracles, or reasons or purpose for uh, why he's done what he's doing, whether it's you know, the, the, the feeding miracles, right? I mean, we've gone through the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, 
He's raised people from the dead. I mean, we've seen all kinds of things. His uh, the disciples, his apostles have seen all kinds of things. And, and he's gone uh, both different sides of the Sea of Galilee. He's gone deep, you know, 100 miles deep into Gentile territory. He's come back and he's gotten back deep into uh, Jewish territory. And he's just teaching and teaching and teaching. And then uh, we get back to where we just read verse 11. It says, the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Such a familiar situation happening. The Pharisees have gathered, and we know from another gospel account, it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They've both gathered, and the Pharisees did this publicly for a reason. They wanted to humiliate him. So they weren't just pulling him aside saying, listen, we're struggling with our belief, you know. They didn't pull him aside secretly or separately or one-on-one and say, you know, we just need to talk to you. We're hearing these things you're teaching and we have some trouble with it. No, they did it in public. They did it in front of everyone. And they've done it to try to humiliate him. And so the verbiage here, uh, they came out, the Pharisees came out and began to argue with them. That's a pretty intense term. I mean, there's this open debate. I mean, you almost get the idea that he's there with a crowd and it's like they're yelling from within the crowd. They're really trying to cause distraction. They're trying to create chaos. They want this man quiet. And it says, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Now, let me stop for a minute. So much is in this verse that we've, we've got to understand because a lot of times I think people see this verse and uh, they, they, they just think it's like the rest of us. And we've talked about this, those of you who have been with us through the study in Mark, there's often uh, times, maybe some of you have been this way, um, Maybe some of you are this way. Maybe there's just some, maybe some, somebody in here is not a believer, but you're curious. And if that's the case, I'm really glad that you're here. Um, but I, I've certainly had conversations with people that say, yeah, you know, I don't believe in God. I really don't believe in God. I certainly don't believe in Jesus. But, you know, if he were to do a miracle, then I would believe. And we hear this kind of thing often. And my response is always, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't, because there have been plenty of miracles that were, ha- that were done in the New Testament time that never led to faith, you know? People saw the miracle and they still found ways to doubt, still found ways to question. But people still use this verse often to say, look, they're looking for a miracle. They're looking, the Pharisees, the Sadducees are looking for a miracle. And if Jesus would just perform a miracle, that's what they're saying, then they would believe. But that's not what they're saying. Now this is often understood that way, but it's not accurate. And so I wanna show you there's something deeper going on here. And one of the reasons that I wanna explain to you that that's not what's happening in this verse is by the time this confrontation happens, they're two years deep into Jesus's ministry. I mean, they've seen countless miracles. I mean, if we were just to rattle some of the miracles off, my goodness, we'd have several. I just mentioned he's done two miraculous feedings of thousands and thousands. He's raised people from the dead. He's cast out demons. He's healed people who were paralyzed. Uh, He's healed sickness and disease. We've seen all kinds of miracles on earth that he's already performed eight chapters into Mark, two years into his public ministry. That's not what they're asking for. They're asking specifically, look at the wording seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. See, there was this um, kind of a superstition. There was this belief, this understanding, I guess, of the Pharisees, of the Jews, that there were two kinds of miracles. The Jews believed that miracles from heaven, well, those were God miracles. But miracles on earth, well, those were demon miracles. And that's what they often taught and believed, that these earth miracles, well, those were from the devil. And so they're saying, okay, you're, you're the Messiah. We want to see you do a miracle from heaven. We want to see a sign from heaven. Make the sun stand still. You know, another one of the people in the Old Testament did that. Call down fire from heaven. You know, Elijah did that. In fact, you're saying to everybody, you're the Messiah. Well, according to our prophet Joel, you're supposed to then make the sun turn dark and the moon turn to blood. Isn't that what he prophesied? Show us. Show us a sign. But let it be from heaven. A sign from heaven would be not simply a miracle that he performed, but it would be proof of his claims. See, they weren't really asking for a miracle. 
They've already seen miracles. In fact, earlier on in his ministry, a leader from among the rabbis pulled Jesus aside named Nicodemus and said, listen, we believe all these things that you're saying. He says, no one else except someone sent from God, Nicodemus said, could do the things that you're doing. Nicodemus said, we, the rabbis, understand this. So why are they asking for a sign? Why are they asking specifically for a sign from heaven? So I've got three things that I wanna try to prove and show and reveal from this passage today. The first thing I wanna show you is where their desire for this sign from heaven comes from. That's the first thing I wanna walk through. The second thing I wanna walk through is why it's such a problem that they would even seek for this sign. And then the third thing I wanna do is explain what it has to do with the rest of us. And so first, where does their desire for this proof come from? I think that's the first thing we've got to understand because if we're gonna uh, get a good grip or understanding of this passage, then it matters that we know where these guys are coming from. And so it's in Deuteronomy chapter 13. They're pulling this desire for a sign from their Old Testament understanding. And in Deuteronomy 13, now listen, this is a handful of verses that I wanna show you, but these verses are gonna matter so much for us to understand this passage. And look, if we don't understand verses 11, 12, and 13, we're never gonna understand verse 15. And that's the problem that the apostles had. Jesus tried to teach them what we call these three verses. In verse 15, they don't get it. So then he goes 16 to 21, still trying to get them to get it. So we're gonna try to do a better job than the apostles. Y'all up for it? Okay, good. So verse 11, they're asking for a sign from heaven. Here's why. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, are my, screen, are my verses on the screen? Can they be up there? There we go, okay. It says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, do you see that? Gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you've not known and let us serve them. Now think about this. Already in this verse, he's saying if somebody comes up and actually performs a miracle and then says, let's follow after another God, this is what happens. He says, verse three, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is doing what? Testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. This is a big test, y'all. Now the Pharisees are familiar with this passage and they're like, wait a minute, Jesus has been teaching all these things that's different from what we've been teaching. He's been doing all these earth miracles, healings, raising from the dead. He's also been claiming these things like he's Lord of the Sabbath, that he's the son of God. Mark even said to us in the very beginning of chapter one, these things were written to show to us that Jesus is the son of God. So they've got this Jesus, the Pharisees have, they have Jesus saying that he's the Messiah. They're like, show us a sign from heaven. Show us a sign like these other prophets before you did. Show us a sign like Joel, the prophet before you said would happen. And the fact that they're even considering this verse means they categorically reject what he's teaching. I mean, even it says in Deuteronomy, even if his miracles happen, but he says, let's follow after another God. Don't listen to him. Think about this. Even if someone performs a miracle but what they're teaching is not consistent with the Bible, ignore them. There's more. Verse four, he says, you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. I mean, we see some passionate concepts here. When someone comes up to you and they do something amazing, they perform a miracle before your very eyes. Are you listening to this church? and yet they're telling you to follow after another God, this is a test. God is saying to you, even if someone does a miracle in front of you, do not turn your back on God, do not turn away from God, don't turn your heart from God. You can say, well, this guy did a miracle. I think we're approaching last days and there's gonna be antichrist coming up doing some amazing things and it's gonna lead Christians to say, but they're doing miracles. Who else but someone sent by God can do a miracle. Listen to what they teach. Know what your Bible says because if that miracle worker, that dreamer of dreams can perform a miracle and yet tell you to turn your eyes away from God himself, it's a test from the Lord. It said cling to God. And then the next verse, he says, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. What did the Pharisees want done to Jesus? They wanted him put to death, didn't they? So you shall purge the evil from among you. 
Show us a sign from heaven, they're saying. It's not just that verse, even in Deuteronomy 18. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Uh, Presumptuously is one of those $10 words. I never use them. It means pridefully. Pridefully. That's the thing that the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it pridefully. You know what happens? And this is where I'm all the time messing with TV preachers because they come up with some kind of crazy uh, prophecy or forecast. Like, oh yeah, you know, the world's gonna come to an end on May 15th or whatever. Doesn't happen. Well, they're speaking pridefully because they know if they can start coming up with some crazy concepts, they're gonna get all kind of attention and people who are prideful love attention, Right? So they're doing this pridefully. He says, you should not be afraid of them. Because what's going to happen is these false teachers, these false prophets, are not teaching what God has said. They're turning your eyes away from God and toward themselves. They're doing it because of their own pride. He says, don't even be afraid of them. Because this is what these false teachers, these false prophets, and there's tons of them. That's what they do. They're like, listen to me. Listen to me. Focus on me. God's given me a word, they say. God has spoken to me, they say. The Spirit's leading me, they say. God is directing me, they say. It's all a bunch of baloney. If you want to know what God has to say to you, open your Bible and read it. But these false, presumptuous, pride-filled preachers... They existed back then, these false prophets, they existed then. So that's where their desire is coming from. I mean, put simply, here's what the word of God is saying. It's almost like the word of God is saying, miracles are easy. Bad theology, demonic. That's that passage in a nutshell. Even if a false prophet does a miracle, even if a false teacher does a miracle, if they turn your eyes away from God, false, false theology, demonic. So the Pharisees are making it clear. They categorically reject the things that Jesus is teaching. And so they wanted a sign from heaven. They wanted a sign to confirm the meaning of the miracles Jesus had done. Now the reason they were trying to confirm this meaning is because they've already revealed that they think it's the devil that's been allowing Jesus to do these miracles. They even said it earlier in the book of Mark, that they think the power of his miracle ability comes from the devil himself. In fact, it's in Mark chapter three. I'll read it to you, verse 22. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he's possessed by Beelzebul, that's the devil, and he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. See, they were already saying that he's getting this miracle power from the devil, from the demons, this is demonic power. They're like, this is it. We need a sign from heaven. We need a sign from God, from heaven to confirm. So what they're asking for is not really a miracle. They're asking for proof of his authority, proof of his claims. And they would only allow this proof to come from God himself. Now, do you remember? Because it, it seems pretty clear that those Pharisees, those scribes were not there when Jesus was baptized. Do you remember what happened when Jesus was baptized? There was a voice from heaven saying, this is my son. I'm well pleased in him. Do you remember that? It's a pretty big sign from heaven. So that's where their desire for a sign came from. So Jesus knew that they thought his teaching was demonic. So the next verse is his response to their request. Look at verse 12. It says, sighing deeply in his spirit, he's annoyed. He said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Why does he so strongly refuse to show these folks at this point a sign? Now, this is the second thing I wanna show. First was where they got the idea from. The second thing I wanna show you is why he refused to do it and, and what it is that has to be confronted. Why is their desire for proof such a problem that Jesus understands needs to be confronted? This is why. It's because a demand for a sign is ultimately a demand for undeniable proof, isn't it? Like, I'll believe, but only if you give me undeniable proof. So a demand, church, for a sign for proof. Any of you who are seeking, who are curious, you're wondering if these things about Jesus are true, if his own claims are true, understand that a demand for a sign is ultimately a demand for undeniable proof. And so. 
Put simply, it's, it's just evidence of unbelief. It's a rejection of Jesus' call for radical faith. It's ultimately a rejection of the gospel. So Jesus calls every one of us to make a personal decision to follow him, to, to give a response to what he has said, not a response to some miracle that we've witnessed. We're supposed to give a response of faith because of the teaching of the gospel. And notice what he says there in verse 12. Why does this generation seek for a sign? He's not even referring just to the Pharisees. He's referring to all of them. He's referring to the entire generation. I mean, he refuses to remove their responsibility. You, you want proof. The gospel demands faith. And so verse 13, leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. I mean, he didn't give them the proof that they wanted. He didn't give them the sign that they wanted. I mean, he just, he wasn't bluffing. There's gonna be no sign. There's gonna be no proof. And so it says he goes to the other side. I mean, there's distance between them physically, but there's distance between them theologically, and there's difference, distance between them even spiritually. So verse 14, they had forgotten to take bread. Now this is where it gets interesting. I told you, if they don't understand verses 11, 12, and 13, they're never gonna understand verse 15 because verse 14 is the transition. It says, they have forgotten to take bread, that's the apostles, and they did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them, and he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Herod, the leaven of Herod. Here's what's happening. So, all of that interaction just happened. They get in the boat, they're traveling to the other side, and he, they notice there's, there's not enough bread, right, from the miracle, I guess, or whatever. They notice it, and he says, be careful. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware the leaven of the Herod. This isn't some extreme change of subject that all of a sudden Mark, the writer here, is saying, now here's what's happening with his interaction with the Pharisees. Oh, what do you know, they ran out of food. No, this is all connected. Jesus sees it as connected, so he says, watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Herod. The, the leaven is, is a metaphor for corruption. That's what leaven is. In the Bible, leaven almost always is a metaphor for corruption somehow. And what the Bible often tries to show is that by using the metaphor of leaven, corruption of a few can impact the many. And so the Pharisees, he's saying, watch out for their leaven. Well, their leaven was the leaven of tradition. They were serious and strong about their tradition, not so strong about what God had taught, but strong about the way they understood it, strong about the way they added to it, strong about the way they'd been teaching it in the synagogues and their rabbinical tradition. Well, that was their leaven. And the problem with their tradition leaven is it fought against the power of the gospel. Now the, the, the leaven of Herod was the leaven of power and the leaven of wealth. And let me tell you, that is a seductive power. That is a seductive uh, leaven. The leaven of power, the leaven of money, the leaven of wealth, it can get into everybody's heart and it fights against the power of the gospel. It's the leaven of Herod. And the evidence that they had of this, this leaven was the hardness in their heart, hard hearts, our evidence of leaven, and the heart becomes hardened only after it's heard the truth. Hard hearts hear truth, even sometimes from the Bible, and just reject it. And before you go, yeah, that's right, man. There are some people that you can just quote the Bible verse to them and they'll just be hard-hearted against it. Let me explain something to you. Church people are just as guilty of this as the unchurched. Church people can, can really get a hard heart when it comes to Christ, can really get a hard heart when it comes to holiness. And I want you to listen to me. And the reason church people can be just as guilty of this is because unlike the unchurched, we can get a little bit of Jesus in us, get a little bit of church in us and think we've done it, we're better than them. And then what happens is someone comes up and confronts your sinful behavior and what happens? You blow up, you get upset, 
How dare they say this? I mean, someone could confront your behavior with a Bible verse, and the only response is so often this anger and rejection, saying, you know, can you believe what this person said to me? Who do they think they are? Hard-heartedness is what's happening. And maybe what you're dealing with is leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of tradition. Maybe what you're dealing with is the leaven of wealth or the le- leaven of power. I mean, Jesus had, had said himself, the love of money is the root of all kind of evil. He didn't say, for the lost. It's for all of us. So we have to be even more vigilant, we who call Jesus our Savior. We've got to be even more cautious. And so Jesus says to his disciples, beware. Beware of their leaven, it's going to seep in. Beware the leaven of Herod. Watch out if politics gets in the church. Oh my goodness. Watch out, those Herodians are going to infiltrate the church. And next thing you know, the pulpit becomes political. Watch out, the Pharisees get involved, and the next thing you know, it becomes all about tradition, less about the gospel, less about reaching the community, less about loving people, serving people, and reaching people with the gospel. No, it becomes more about tradition, money, power. Beware the leaven, church. All of this is what Jesus was confronting. Godly behavior is only based on God's word. Pharisees missed it because of the leaven of the tradition. Herod missed it because of the leaven of his wealth and his power. And the leaven kept them from being humble. It kept them from salvation. And salvation is by God's grace and your faith. It's not by you accepting God's evidence. So after Jesus explains this to them, look how the disciples in the boat responded. Verse 16 They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no more bread. They just missed everything Jesus said. And I look at that, I'm like, how could that happen? And I'm like, oh, well, no, no, no wonder. They're men. What do you expect? I mean, just imagine, like, Jesus has given this some incredible, incredible doctrine, and they're like, yeah, so we're out of food? Wait a minute. Like, there's this immediate... And then it even says, uh, they began to discuss with one another. It's such a calm, passive translation. It's a heated debate. Who forgot the bread? Judas, it was you, wasn't it? Wasn't me, I told Andrew, don't tell me that, I got John, and he was supposed to get the bread. Like, you can just imagine, and Jesus is like, oh my goodness. (laughs) And so Jesus said to them, aware, Jesus aware of this said to them, verse 17, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? I mean, the truth he wants them to see is not about food, but something so much greater. I mean, plenty of people had gathered. Listen to this now. Two years into his ministry, plenty of people had gathered. Plenty had seen his miracles. Plenty had heard his message. But Jesus, he expects his disciples to not just see what he's done, not just hear what he's taught, but to also learn from it, reflect on it, and grow. If anybody could have had the excuse to not grow deeper in their walk with God, it would have been the apostles. They could be like, y'all, we literally walked with Jesus. You think that you're doing better than me? You're gonna confront me? Ha! I shook his hand one time. He washed my feet one time. And yet Jesus is constantly confronting them. He's like, do you have a hard heart after two years? How often has this happened to any of you? If you think for a moment, you can remember times where God showed up in your life. God provided, God protected. The prayers you prayed and God answered how many, of, how many of God's answered prayers in your life have you forgotten? You never even went back to say thank you, God, for that. How easy it is, man, for us to just forget what God has done for us. And Jesus says to them the same thing. Verse 18, having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? Do you not remember? Have you forgotten? Two years I've been teaching you. You've seen every miracle I've done in two years. You've heard all of my explanations. You saw me walking on water. 
Have you forgotten? How do you forget these things? He says, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? He, they said 12. Now it's like a pop quiz. I mean, how do you like this? Verse 20, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. You know, they're like, ha, got it right at 100. Ask me another one, Jesus. Here's the problem, man. The problem was that they knew the answers. The problem is they knew. They just missed the significance. They had eyes, they just didn't see. They had ears, they just didn't hear. And they either for, forgot what he did or they forgot why he did it. And he's like, man, I gave you so much, there was plenty left over. You know what their problem was? They enjoyed what was provided, they just ignored the provider. It's the same problem with so many of us. I mean, we enjoy all the things God has given us and we miss it, we miss the point. And God could look at you and say in your life, when you prayed and I provided, how much was left over? And you could get that answer right. When you begged and I said yes, how much was left over? And you'd get that answer right. See, the problem is not that you don't know. The problem is that you do. In verse 21, he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? I mean, this question, do you not yet understand? It's as much for the apostles then as it is for you and me now. I mean, people think the point of this passage is that Jesus was the the bread in the boat with him, he's the true loaf. That's not the point at all. And his repeated questions to them, how much was left over, 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 it shows that his point is that they've forgotten who he is. His point is that he's the Messiah, he's the Savior, he's God. You're worried about the wrong thing, bread? You're worried about bread, you're worried about food, you're worried about money, you're worried about your income, you're worried about your checking account, why are you so bothered about your stomach? You need to think a whole lot more about what's gonna corrupt your soul. And you hear this and you say, okay, how do I apply any of this to my life? I mean, this is 2,000 years ago. How am I gonna apply this to 2023 and all that we're dealing with? I'm going to give you three ways, and I'm going to do it in reverse order. Number one, learn how to focus more on your soul than you do on your stomach. Number two, don't let the leaven of pride and wealth give you spiritual amnesia. Remember what God has done for you. And number three, the only miracle that should lead you to faith in Jesus is the resurrection and the empty tomb. That's it. It's the only sign that'll be given. And he calls it even later the sign of Jonah. You want a miracle? In order to believe, he gave us the greatest miracle. When he died on the cross for our sin, was buried in the tomb, raised again to life three days later, defeating death, conquering the penalty of sin, and our only responsibility is to place our faith in him. Learn what he's taught us. Reflect on it. Apply it to our life so that the longer you follow Jesus, the closer to him you get and the more like him you become. That's what's happening in this passage. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. God, we are so thankful for this passage. God, you've been so good to us. God, you've made it so clear, so obvious. And so, Father, for those in this room who have been following you a long time, God, I'm asking that you would help us 
not to forget what you've done and all you've provided, not to forget all the prayers you've answered, not to forget all the ways you've shown us who you are. Father, we have your word as evidence and we have your goodness to us as evidence. We have forgiveness of sin as evidence. We have salvation as evidence. God, we don't need you to do anything else. You've done so much more than we deserve. You're so good. God, we're so needy. You're so faithful. We're so forgetful. So I don't know, church, maybe as your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, you're realizing that God has used this passage today to draw you back closer with him. And maybe you just need a moment just to pray to him and say, God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your power. God, thank you. Let me not be forgetful. Let me not get a hardened heart. So maybe you just want to pray where you are. Maybe you want to come forward. I mean, the altar will be open in a second. You can just come up and pray. You can come up by yourself. You can bring somebody with you. Some of you may be curious. You're not sure. But you're starting to realize that God is pursuing you. He cares about you. He knows what you're going through. So in the end of this prayer, when we say amen and we stand, I just want you to come forward. You can come forward and talk to one of the people who will be down here. And you can just say, I want to talk to someone about God. You can say, I've got questions. I just want to talk. It may be that you know about these things. You're just ready to join the church. Maybe it's time for you to finally get baptized and quit putting off all the excuses and reasons not to. So make a decision. Come forward. Let today be your day. Whatever it is, whatever it is in which God is really drawing your attention to him right now, don't walk away from him. Don't walk away. Father, I pray. Father, I pray that the thing in which you're, you're drawing our attention to something right now, God, I pray that it lingers for a while that we not let ourselves be distracted, that we not lose this connection with you that we've got where you're, you're, you're wanting us, you're leading us to respond in some real way, not just nodding in agreement, but God responding. And in that way, becoming more like your son, Jesus. That's, that's our goal for us because that's your goal for us, that we would be conformed to the image of your son. So church, as your eyes are closed, your head is bowed, you know in which way God's wanting you to respond. So when I say amen and we stand, you need to do that. You get up, you come forward. This is the day, this is the hour. Father, we ask that you give courage where it's needed, strength where we're weak, confidence where we're afraid. Draw us closer to you. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Pastor Brian has given us some great takeaways. Be sure to take some time to reflect on all the things we've learned and how we can apply those teachings to our lives. If by chance you prayed that prayer during the invitation for the first time, we want to congratulate you and welcome you to God's family. That's a really big deal to us and we want to celebrate by connecting with you. Let us know you made that decision by clicking on the I made a decision link in the chat and we'll be able to connect with you on a personal level and walk you through our next steps. We want to thank you for being with us. We love you and we look forward to seeing you next week.